Uh, welcome to this workshop on writing a statement of purpose and personal statement. Uh, before we begin, as always, just a few quick housekeeping rules. Uh, please ensure that you stay muted uh, throughout the initial presentation part of this workshop. Um, if you have any questions, of course, uh, feel free to either raise your hand or drop your questions in the chat. Uh, but please remember that this meeting is being recorded, which basically means that if you choose to raise your hand, unmute yourself and talk, then you will be captured as a part of the recording. Um, and you know that these recordings are being shared internally with all mentees. So um, as long as you don't mind being seen by other mentees um, on the Pakistan Graduate Mentorship Program, feel free to turn on your um, videos and microphones and talk. Okay, uh, that being said, um, this is the outline for today's session. I'll quickly introduce you to your panelists um, and give you a sense of um, why these workshops are being organized. And then I'll hand it over to your panelists to take you through what a personal statement is, what are the things you're meant to be uh, talking about within your personal statement? Is it just grades or are you supposed to mention other things that you have done? Um, throughout your life? Um, what are the basics you're meant to be addressing and how do you structure this SOP? Um, and I think we'll also take you through a couple of brainstorming questions that might help you put your SOP together neatly and then give you some general tips as well before we transition to the Q&A part um, of this workshop. Um, about the workshop, as you're aware, we've put together this 10-part workshop series for the benefit of all mentees because, um, you know, you started the graduate mentorship program a little late into the application cycle, and we thought it would be quicker if you had access to these uh, common workshops to get all the basics out of the way and then, um, of course, get more meaningful um, support from your mentors with respect to more specific questions. Um, I'm I'm fairly certain that most of you by now would have already connected with your mentors, uh, but just in case you haven't, feel free to DM me on this uh, call so I can look into what's happening behind the scenes. Um, but uh, just to reassure you, if your mentor hasn't reached out to you yet, they will in the next um, few working days. So please don't worry. Uh, but Anyway, just feel free to DM me um, in case you're worried about anything. Uh, today's workshop, as you know, uh, is aimed at providing guidance on how to write a compelling personal statement um, or even a statement of purpose. And we'll also provide you tips on structure, content, and showcasing your unique qualities. Um, well, these are your wonderful panelists for the day who will be taking you through uh, this whole exercise of writing um, an SOP or a personal statement. Um, I'm, I'm sure you can see on your screens um, precisely what each of the mentors um, or panelists are doing. Uh, as you can tell, it's quite a diverse panel. We have a few who have done master's degrees. We have a few who, have, who are doing uh, PhDs um, and in quite a diverse disciplines. So feel free to ask any discipline specific questions that you have as well and your uh, panelists will try their best to um, answer your questions. Um, so we have Kansa, Rapia, Shanze, Vajiha and Mohsin joining us. Um, and this is a quick, quick recap from workshop one. I'm sure all of you recall um, that you were told a little bit about what you are meant to be doing with um, your graduate application, what kind of application documents you're meant to be putting together. And you may remember that a statement of purpose is also something that you're meant to be talking about. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that and hand over to Kansa, uh, who's our first panelist uh, for this evening. Kansa, over to you. Thank you so much, Gayatri. Hi, everyone. Um... As Gayatri mentioned, my name is Hansa. I'm just to give a brief introduction again. Um, I'm currently doing a DPhil in education um, at Oxford. And before this, I did my MPhil in development studies. Um, and my undergrad was in culture and politics. So in this session, we will talk personal statements. So before we go to personal statements, um, we'll just do a brief recap. So what do you need to make a good personal statement? 
sorry can you still hear me i feel like i have a little bit of an internet issue gayatri we can still hear you hansa okay perfect so what is a, a statement of purpose or a sop it's basically a document that describes your reasons for applying to a particular program uh your research interests and your career programs your relevant experience um your background and why you are a good fit for a particular degree and then obviously you put in your cv with your personal statement to sort of give a holistic picture of what you've done so far and your educational qualifications your experience and sort of again like why you need that particular um you know qualification other than these two documents you of course also give your writing samples um or essays depending on the requirements of a specific program um writing samples demonstrate basically your research skills and your writing skills and then you also give some academic qualification documents such as your previous degrees and transcripts and sometimes um you know you're also ask for uh different language tests such as tfl and then also you may be ask for research proposals if you're applying for a phd program sometimes and then obviously we we've had a, a session on research proposals um so you can definitely go back and listen to the recording and then the last thing you're also asked for is letters of recommendations these are uh from either your professors or people you've worked with in some capacity just to give a picture of what you're like to work with in particular environments and um describe your strengths um you know these are supposed to be from mentors or someone who knows you really really well or someone who supervised a dissertation or something of the sort next slide please slide 6 so what is a personal statement again almost every graduate program requires that you hand in a personal statement of there are very 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 few programs that you know won't require it and some programs say that this is optional but don't consider this as optional because if you want to be admitted into a particular program you really need to explain to them why you deserve to be there and how it will help you in your future degree um even if they don't call it a personal statement it'll be some sort of a admissions essay or if you know if they give a specific prompt but the idea is still the same um in this part of the admissions process um universities give the applicants basically a chance or an opportunity to showcase their uh, different strengths and basically who they are um you know grades and test scores aren't the only thing that define you sometimes you may not have the best grades or you may have the best grades but they need to see who you are as an applicant and why you deserve to be in that program and and sometimes your grades are really good but they want to see why you're a good fit for that specific program because every program has its own strengths and limitations um and you as a person are just more than a number um more than an application more than you know your grades or uh, all of those things that you may have submitted as extra documents which is why you need this personal statement to really introduce you and your goals and who you are as a person next slide please the most important thing about the personal statement or a statement of purpose is that it ties your grades together and your application materials like the other thing you submit like your grades your like your cv like all the the applications essay you may have submitted um and and it gives you a holistic picture your admissions uh, officers understand who you are as a person as a student and the things that drive you um the the statement of pur purpose will tell who you are and what you want to be in a more much more detailed and personal way than anything else that you may have submitted uh, or any other components in the application 
it'll basically describe the package deal of who you are and what you'll bring to the program. Um, yeah, next person. I think Shanze, it's you. Thanks, Hamza. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shanze, and I recently completed a master's in business administration at the University of Oxford. And prior to this, I've also done an undergrad and an MPhil in development studies. So just taking you through a few more of the basics around what to expect for the personal statement. One way of looking at this could be answering some questions around who you are as a person as an app or as an applicant. So try to think of it as that insight into this more holistic sense of uh, of your application. And I like the way that it was framed as a way of tying all the different elements together. So the who you are as a person, as a student, where do your interests lie? Where did they come from? How did you become interested in this topic uh, or field of study? What's your sort of story behind it? What was your motivation? Um, what have you done so far in this field? Perhaps it's a new field you're positioning yourself for. Perhaps there's something that came before this that directed you towards thinking about something else or continuing that field of study. The the why and the how of what you want to why you want to be doing this field of study is is so incredibly important. And that's because it because it connects both the where you came from with the where you want to go piece. So why is it important for you to be um doing this program of study? And then why is it important that uh this university and program course was the one that you specifically wanted to apply to? And that takes a bit of research and consideration of what are the elements of that university, of that program course, uh, perhaps there are elements that draw you, drew you to it. Um, and why do you think that you specifically are a good fit? So this is where it does link back to your who. And in terms of why you're a good fit, I think this the other question that the recruitment team will be asking themselves is what will you be like as a student in the classroom for the professors, for your other classmates, um, for anyone that you're interacting with. So what do you actually want to bring to that environment? Uh, and will you be conducive to helping your learning process and the others in your class in their learning process, particularly if you're doing a interactive degree like I did in a, in a social science or in business? It's so much more about your peer learning as well as your individual learning. So that's another element to keep in mind. Uh, in terms of your work experience, that might vary, and it's an opportunity to bring that in. If you have some or if you don't, there's definitely other ways in which you're bringing in your experience that isn't just formal work experience, but perhaps if you do have formal work experience, you might uh, tailor your story differently. Next slide, please. So just a few uh, basics in terms of length and formatting. Typically, each uh, application process will state what the requirements are for length. It can vary 500 to 1,000 words is quite standard. If they don't give a specific length, uh, try and not make it more than two pages, I'd say within a page uh, or two pages with double spaced formatting is, is ideal as it allows enough time for us to get to know you as a person, but also we have to be considerate that they're reading through a lot of applications. And so making it too long could be a disservice to you. So uh, think about following the any standard guidance they give around formatting and length. Next slide, please. So the style of your personal statement, it's a chance to both, I mean, in some cases, as was mentioned, you might need to submit a writing sample, which is very much more, how do you write academically? What have you written in the past? Um, while the statement of purpose is not a academic style writing paper, it's still a, a chance for you to showcase your writing ability in a bit more of an informal and personal way. And that can also reflect, you know, your educational level and your qualifications and understanding that you also know what academic writing entails. So if you are going to, say, add in references of something you've read or are inspired by that you know how to do that correctly and that you're looking to structure your argument in a similar way to how you'd look to structure an academic paper. Um, but we'll go into structure in, in, a, in a minute. 
So some tips to consider uh, around how you think about this graduate level of academic style of writing. You could also still use a more personal tone. So it's in fact encouraged to you refer to yourself in the first person, use active voice, talk about yourself, what you have done, what you've done alongside others. So that's a little bit different to academic writing. Um, you can use it to structure things either chronologically or in a different thematic way, but really talking about your actions that you've taken, center yourself as the main protagonist in this. And uh, yeah, avoid using passive voice because that, that detracts from what you've done yourself. Um, and then, yeah, use lots of details and reference specific things that you have done courses, professors, academic areas of research, or methods or schools or programs that you've attended. So be as specific as possible with some of the examples that you're going to be using. And I think we'll touch on that a little bit more later. Next slide, please. So just on how to think about your structure, like any piece of writing, I think having a structure is, is key. So your introduction is one of the most important things because it's what's going to atta uh, attract the reader's attention. So you need a powerful opening paragraph, opening statement that introduces who you are, uh, what course you're applying to and why. Why is it that program and why you as a as a applicant? So that will in, in a way form your thesis statement as you would consider writing any other paper. So that's a really important one to focus on how to get right, concise and uh, get across your message. In the middle, you're then starting to elaborate on some of the specifics, starting to describe some of your background, your experience and your interests. Again, you could think about other like creative ways in which you wanna structure this. Perhaps you want a three point structure around um, here's what brought me here. Here's what I want want to do out of the program in future. But you can think about different ways. Or here are three things you need to know about me and why, for example. But really, here we need we're we're trying to understand. You know, what made you decide to pursue that master's degree? What are your goals? What are you hoping to do with that program? Uh, and what do you want to achieve from it afterwards? And how will that program specifically help you get to where you want to go? after um, and then your conclusion just kind of tying it all together from your thesis uh, and um, really giving us a, a final look into who you are as a person and remember to end on a, a pleasant and a polite note so that we we have a good takeaway so thanks I'm going to pass it on to the next speaker I think it's Mohsen yeah thank you uh, Shanti uh, so this is Mohamed Mohsen uh, and I did my master's in Erasmus scholarship. Uh, and I've been like supporting students for the last two years in writing their statements of purpose and motivation letters. So I'll try to share my experience as well about because I see that there are some very common mistakes that are done every in every letter and every time. So I'll besides explaining this slide, I'll also tell you about what's the common mistakes that are done. Uh, so as uh, Shanzi was mentioning about the uh, like every piece of writing has a structure, so your letter needs to have a structure as well. And this is more. Uh, this slide is more about. Uh, we are going into details of what the structure is and how you want to formulate that structure. Uh, the first most important thing is that uh, your letter is more like a, your story. It's about you, uh, and um, uh, it's not uh, essential, but it's always ideal that you follow a sequential order, because that helps the reader to follow what you write. If you don't follow this order, then it will be more haphazard and uh, they might skip your, uh, you know, story. So it's better to follow an order, uh, which is chronological, means like you start from your, let's say, school or bachelor's and then you move on towards your other experiences. Uh, um, now, the number of paragraphs, basically, they depend on the, the format or like the length you have. Like in some letters, they give you space for two pages. In, in some letters, they give you one page. So you need to understand how many uh, paragraphs you can write in total. So depending on the total paragraphs you have, you have to decide whether you write one paragraph for each topic or you write two paragraphs in some topics. Uh, the first paragraph uh, is the most important, I think, because 
that's what uh, we normally call as the hook statement or like it's your unique selling point um uh, you can also think about is as a uh, your um you know pitch statement if you are uh, selling your business basically in the letter you are uh, you are selling yourself you are convincing them that you are the right person that they should consider for that program right so you really need to think out of the box what commonly students do is that they they just follow the same style like they say since my childhood i was interested in this subject and then i got to know about this and that and i think it's very uh, conventional now like every other person is doing that so try to think about something which tells your passion it could be any event that happened in your life it could be uh, anyone any person who inspired you maybe some professor maybe someone in your family anyone who inspired you to to consider that field so think out of different ideas and then start your letter that would be really helpful uh, the second part is when you transition towards your background now after you have made your hook statement you need to go into your background like why you are saying that statement right so you have to tell a bit about your background story and then you gradually move towards your academic background so it it could be your bachelor's if you are done masters then you can talk about your master courses as well and you have to be a bit more specific don't just make general statements like you say i did my bachelor's in some subject it's better if you mention your classes your subjects your courses your professors so it will look that you have some you have put some efforts in writing that piece right so try to make it a bit more detailed uh and then besides your academics you need to show them that you have some uh, personal skills as well like leadership teamwork so you need to highlight that using your extracurricular activities let's say you participated in some uh, association you were part of a society uh, and you were organizing some events so it's always good to show them your soft skills so after your academic background uh, try to highlight uh, how you are as a person how do you work with people uh what kind of experience you have with working with teams uh and then uh try to mention about your publications uh and uh, towards the end before the conclusion it's, a, it's an, another important paragraph is about why you are applying for this specific program so you need to mention or talk about the program itself so it you transition from talking about yourself towards the program and for that you need to go through the websites or talk to your friends who are already studying that program like what kind of professors are there what kind of subjects you will study uh, so that will also show them that you have done some homework uh, in analyzing what the program is um, so next slide so this is again the the same point which i was explaining but here uh, it's like in more details let's say the first as i said was your hook statement where you have to capture the reader so this is i think quite essential uh, and then you move towards your background your motivations and then you elaborate your academic background as well and extracurricular activities um, you have to make very gradual transitions uh, in some cases i see students they jump quite rapidly like they talk about one point and all of a sudden they are talking about something else so when you make transitions try to uh, uh, gradually connect your each para like the last statement of your para should somehow connect the opening of the next para as well right so it makes a very gradual story between all the para paragraphs that you have to write uh next slide yeah and this is again the same points about publications about publications uh, if you have five six publication that does not mean that you have to mention all of them the important thing is that you have to highlight the ones which are most relevant to that program uh and it's also not good that you just mention the name you can also talk about what skills you learned from it and how that skills that you have could help you in your future so try to connect your publications with the program you are applying to uh and about para number 7 which is about the program itself uh try to mention the professors that you anticipate that would be teaching you in future or talk about the university itself like uh, let's say if you are applying in a university in england then uh, do some research go to their website see the curriculum 
uh, and see how it can be related to you. You have to make the connection back to yourself. So in the beginning, you are talking about yourself, but here it's more about the program that you're applying to. Uh, and then you have to conclude uh, with just a brief statement of intent. So that's from my side. Uh, let's move to the next speaker. Yeah, that will be me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohsen. That was really great. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Rabia Khan, and I'm a DPhil student in clinical epidemiology, medical statistics at the University of Oxford. I'm also an OPP scholar, and I'm an associate lecturer at University of Derby. I teach at the College of Health, Psychology and Social Care, specializing in health protection and epidemiology and statistics. So a lot of the things that I will cover will probably be reiteration of what the previous speakers have said. But the first step of your personal statement or statement of interest or, you know, these words used interchangeably is the brainstorming session. Um, and this will probably for some people it might take you a few days for some people it might even take a week so I highly recommend you give yourself that time to motive you know to sit down to write whatever you think is important and then go discuss it with your friends or discuss it with your parents just discuss it with peers who are in similar situation and then come back write it again you will be astounded at how much difference it makes when somebody else gives you a you know clear picture or a different perspective as well so we'll cover uh, these one by one so these in no way are an exhaustive list of what should be covered in a personal statement um i've reviewed personal statements for the last 3 years and you know different um students write it differently but these are the main things these are the minimum things that should be covered because at the end of the day, it is your journey that you are trying to communicate to the admissions panel. Um, you know, when somebody is applying to a program, you all are eligible by grades. So that doesn't tell the admission committee much. So pretty much everyone might have straight A's, they might have B's and A's. But what really stands you apart is your experiences and how you've used your previous education to learn something or contribute to something in the field that you pursued, say for your undergraduate or you pursued for your A-levels or FSC. Um, since my background is in epidemiology and health and uh, health services strengthening, most of the examples that I will give might be relevant to that, but hopefully it will inspire you and you know help you see similar examples in your field, field as well. So the first thing you should brainstorm about is academic and professional interests and motivation. So what most interests you about this area of study? Now, what admission committee doesn't want to see is that somebody writes, well, in the last, say, couple of months, I've decided I'm doing something completely different than what I've done for my A-levels, bachelors and masters. Because what we want to say is that you've been thinking about this for some while. It's It's not... It's, you're not some, doing it on your whim. It's not something that one day you wake up and you've decided you're passionate about something. What we want to see is, are you able to propagate or are you able to progress in what you've already started studying? So say if you've done a bachelor's in engineering and then you've done a master's, which specializes it even further, and then you're going to do a PhD, which will be a specialization in that. So we want to see that funnel. We want to see how you chose a broader subject, which pretty much everyone does as a bachelor student, and how are you narrowing it down to the area of your interest? So what interests you about this area of study? Is it a particular topic? Are you passionate about sustainable engineering? Are you passionate about architecture? It could be anything, but you need to know what is it that interests you, and that will shine through. You know, your passion actually does shine through your personal statements, and then why are you interested in this area and topic? So so what is it? Are you passionate about the implications it has on, say, the health of a society? Are you passionate about it because it has impact on the education of a society? Or, you know, just like I said, sustainability, pollution. It could be anything. Is it economically viable, whatever you're recommending or whatever you're studying? How is it making any difference? So why are you interested in this area and topic? And when did you first start to show an interest in this? How did you exhibit this interest? So very cliche, uh, just like Mohsen mentioned, a lot of people will say, since my childhood, I wanted to be a doctor. Like this is the most cliche one, you know, as an admission committee officer we receive. And it's like, you probably didn't even know what was happening when you were a child. So 
we want to see is that, okay, while I was studying my undergraduate, I was really inspired by this research this certain professor was taking or undertaking, or I attended an event, I attended a conference, I attended a training activity, and over that, there was this exchange of ideas that inspired me, or I read an article, say, in The Economist, or I don't know, whichever magazine is relevant to your field, or whichever journal, you read something in there, and that inspired you, whatever that expert said, you could resonate with it. So when you're writing something for a master's level, or a PhD, or DPhil level, that's the kind of um expression of interest we're looking for we're not looking for what you were interested in as a kid that might be relevant and maybe you you can weave a really good narrative but what we want to see now at this stage is that you're already consulting relevant or high caliber academic pieces and hence that is what is inciting your interest that is what is leading to your interest in this field um so yeah academic background what majors, classes or other experiences have you had in this field? So the point is, we want to show a full picture. Say if you are an engineering major, I don't care if you say, I took a critical analysis of Leonardo's art, unless it is somehow relevant to the engineering degree you're taking. And I need you to show me that link. I need you to show me how what you studies is relevant to this program. So everything has to tie down to you and this program. So say, for example, when I was applying for this one scholarship at the University of Sheffield, they particularly focused on health economics, modeling and decision science. So that program was very heavily reliant on mathematics. So I particularly mentioned that in my uh, high school math, I took calculus and that's a particular grade I achieved. That was the second highest for that school for that year so that those are the kind of things you have to sell yourself here and then I said how I took the same course in university I achieved an A grade and hence I know that this is you know I've been enjoying this course for a long time I've been doing well in it the professors have liked the work I've produced it's a high quality work I'm producing and those are my academic experiences that are leading me here to this field now also moving on which of your work research or extracurricular, extracurricular experiences are related to this field one common thing that I often see is, um, and one that I came across recently was, this was a, a student applying for public health. And she wrote about how she was a hairdresser before she took her nursing program. So in, in a place like, say, Australia, Canada, England, it's it's very common to see people actually pivot from career to career. So you might come across people who are police for the first two, three years of their, you know, after they graduate, and then they one day decide they want to become an engineer or they want to become a nurse. That's perfectly fine, but you need to show me that transition. And she mentioned that she was a hairdresser, but there was no way she was tying that down to why she wanted to do public health. Well, she could have, like, she could have made a very good narrative. So if I were her, I would say something like, while interacting with my clients, I realized, you know, certain people were a lot sicker or certain people from certain backgrounds were a lot sicker. It could be anything. So anything, any moment could inspire you and you need to weave that story. So just telling me that you were a hairdresser and then you decided to become a nurse and now you want to do public health. It just looks like you're jumping. Uh, so I need to see what led to that jump and you need to explain that to whoever the admission uh, committee is. So mention your extracurricular activities, but do show that those extracurricular activities have instilled in you things like persistence, motivation, uh, independence, and leadership qualities. Now, moving on to publications, for a master's application, and particularly for a DPhil or PhD application, it is ideal if you have publication. It could be journal publications, it could be abstract publications, anything that could demonstrate that you can work independently as a researcher. So what work have you published or written? So is it relevant to the field? Also, one common mistake that many students make is they will say things like, I have published in scientific journals, and that's it. Now, I don't, you have to tell me that you are good for this program, or you have to tell the admission committee that you are good for the program. I'm not going to sit there and do the guessing for you. Now, I don't know what impact factor that journal had. Was it impact factor 0 0.5 or was it impact factor 5 or 10 because because that makes a big difference right that's a reflection of your work what journal was it was it just a local journal is it an international journal so you have to sell yourself so if you publish something mention say i published a paper looking at education in children under five 
um, whose parents are in a certain profession. And it was published in the British Journal of Education. I'm making that up, but I'm just saying that's how you should frame that. And the journal had an impact factor of this. And it has been cited, if it has been cited, say if you've published it, say two or three years ago, it should have been cited by someone. Then you can get that information from Google Scholar. So you can mention that paper was further cited by so many people in the field. That That's great because that already tells me or your professor, this person knows what he or she's doing. They're already thinking like an expert in the field. So name it and quantify it. I think what pay, uh, students really struggle with mostly is, and when they're brainstorming specifically, they're not quantifying quantify everything don't say i've published work say i've published three papers you just saying i've published papers or saying i've published two papers or one paper that's more impactful so when you put a number it's a lot more impactful for the admission committee so yeah mention the work that you've published whether it's also a letter to an editor say you did not agree with somebody's work and hence you wrote to the editor with your perspective and why you didn't agree with that work so showing that criticality that's also another key thing sometimes we look at personal statements and it's just description i did this i did this and then i did that and then i went on i did this but there's no criticality in it that one paragraph should definitely be dedicated to your work and you should demonstrate criticality so say something like well, somebody else before me did this study and I decided as a master's student that I, or as a bachelor's student, because I do know some bachelor programs also have a thesis component, you can say, I did not agree with that. Or maybe you did agree with it, but you wanted to study it further. You wanted to move it one step further. Hence, I decided to answer this question in my research or I wrote an essay on it. And this is what, you know, my research um, explained or this is what my research indicated. So you need to show that criticality. Also, what are your short term and long term goals? Now, nobody wants you to sit down and write, I'm going to be a director of CERN or I'm going to be a director of RIM or Microsoft. That's not what we're expecting. What you need to show is that you're trainable and you aim to train further people. Because if you're in academia or if you are going to a PhD level, you will definitely have plenty of opportunities for mentoring others. So what we want to see is that you want to become an expert in the field, be a respectable expert in the field. And eventually the goal is that you will train further people in the field as well. So that your short term goal could be, you know, I'm working, I'm studying this now. My short term goal is to work in this particular lab as a postdoc because I'm passionate about the research they're doing. And my long term goal is to work in academia and further train, you know, more students. So have a short term and a long term goals. Um, what do you hope to accomplish academically? So whether you want to go in academia after this, that could be a reason. Or what is it? Why are you here in this degree? So for me, when I was applying for a DPhil, I was asked, why do you want to do this? And one of the reasons was because once I went to the field and I started working in the field, I realized how limited my knowledge is. Once only I was exposed to how broad the working knowledge was in the field, I decided I wanted to come back and learn more. And that's perfectly fine. So what sort of research or professional work do you want to do in the future with your graduate degree or PhD? You could say you want to work in the industry. So that could be the pharmaceutical industry. If you're an engineer, you could say maybe you want to work in the aeronautical industry, such as Boeing, or it could be anything, you know, so you probably have better idea of what kind of industries are relevant to your educational field. But yeah, it could be academia or industry, but having a good picture at this stage definitely helps. Can we move to the next slide, please? So recent research, professional activities and preparation. Yeah. So what work have you been involved in recently that has prepared you for this program? Um, ideally, what happens is that if a, pe a person's done their bachelor's, they will have gone and work. Or if they've done a master's, after the master's, they might have done a year or two placement or some kind of work. So if you could bring that in, that really gives you more credit because it's like, OK, so this person has gone out they have work and that's why they want to be in this field it's not like because we've also seen statements where students will say things like i did a bachelor so the next logical step was doing a master's and now the next logical step is doing a phd now that does not help anybody and that makes me feel like well this person perhaps has nothing else to do so when you're brainstorming and if you have work use that to your benefit when you were in the field when you were working what particular gaps stood out to you so say if you were a vaccinator in Pakistan. What what was it that stood out to you when you saw the polio campaign or could be anything? Uh, or, you know, maybe you were assessing the economics of Bangladesh for some kind of 
you know, essay. What is it that you think we learn from there that you could apply here? So, you know, any kind of activity you've done, any kind of work, use that in your personal statement. Let it help you shine. So why are you interested in this university and graduate program? Now, this is very important. And the reason I say this is because students tend to treat the department. They don't sometimes even mention the department and they will go on about, well, I want to come to the University of Cambridge or I want to come to University of Derby or Oxford because it's a great university. Um, you know, at the heart of it, there's inclusion. I will be supported. No, first, into, first tell me, why do you want to come to this department? Sometimes universities are so huge that a certain department might have certain, say, um, programs to support their students, which the other department might not have, you know, or they might not even have, have heard of. So you need to really, really research your departments. The first thing when you're doing, when you're brainstorming is go to the department in that particular uh, university they always have a page of what the alumni are saying or what the current students are saying read those and see if any of that reflect with you if any of that resonate with you always lay the case by saying why you want to be in this department then move on to the university so I will I always see is that students will just focus on the uni so say I want to come to University of Oxford you know all this university in English speaking world you support your students the, the professors are experts global experts but, you know, what they're teaching in the Department of Education might be very different, what they're teaching in the Department of Epidemiology. So you really need to know the nuances and differences. So focus on that. Also, what I highly, highly recommend during your brainstorming session, and if you have time, is reach out to certain professors. I did that. Some of the professors are very happy to actually connect with um, the students. So in my personal statement, I actually mentioned that during the phase when I was shortlisting potential universities, I reached out to this particular uh, professor I set up a you know time with them we met over teams we discussed our ideas he really liked my idea and he is more than happy to support me so that gives the admission you know officer a picture well you know what this professor already likes this guy because everyone is eligible by grades right now the point is who is it that we like and we think would bring value to this department so if you show that you've already kind of set up that connection with some academic in that department that will really help your statement and what will you bring to this program so definitely do you have some kind of an experience that that program doesn't have or maybe you do have an experience in a field they specialize and maybe you can add more to it are you is there some kind of a software you know that you are really proficient at that will bring value because it will cut your training time so it could be anything and everything how you think you will bring value to a program now, what makes you stand out as a graduate school um, candidate? What other information about you should the school know? So this could be anything that you think bring value. Maybe you traveled and you gained a new perspective on life. Another thing that I always say is, and do mention it, if you have any disabilities, one thing about people from South Asia is that they're very shy of their disabilities. And we do know that people in South Asia have a very high incidence of uh, you know, they're not sometimes, you know, they might have autism, they might have dyslexia. If it's diagnosed or you have hearing impairment, it could be any kind of disability, not necessarily physical or visible, even if it's an invisible one. Mention it in your statement. How has that impacted your journey as a student throughout these years? And how did you persevere? Because the admission committee wants to actually know that. And then do you have any weaknesses or missing elements you need to explain? Uh, you know, any semesters that you had low grades, maybe some bereavement happened, maybe you were sick, you have to take time off, focus on other things. That all makes you, these are all unique things that make you. So you need to weave that into a page or one and a half page. All I say is that you don't have a lot of words. So whatever you write, make it count, make it solid. So sit down, brainstorm, take a break, come back, brainstorm again. And your first personal statement will be very different than your final personal statement. And, and that's perfectly fine. Have it read by a couple of people before you um, send it off. But yeah, I think these are just a few. This is not an exhaustive list, but I hope I've covered most of it and given you some ideas on how you could um, brainstorm for your statement. And I guess now time for the next speaker. Thank you, Rabia. That was super comprehensive, I think. Um, hi, everyone. I am Vichiha. I am doing my MSc in Social Policy at the University of Oxford as an OPP scholar. Um, so I'll take you to the, through the general 
steps and what I'm going to try and do is just summarize what all the speakers have already said, um, just to conclude and then we can move on to questions hopefully. Um, so, so the first point is to follow the requirements. Um, sounds obvious, but every department within one university and then every different university and then every different scholarship program that you may be applying to, all of them have very different prompts at times. So the generic term for all of them is like, you know, personal statement or um, statement of purpose, uh, admissions essay, those kind of things, but they actually sometimes cover very diverse areas. Um, they differ in the degree to which they want you to talk about more personal information. Some of them want you to stick to your academic um, journey solely. So they're, they're, they're very different in terms of the prompts, in terms of the um, length of the essay, in terms of the structure of the essay. So just look at the specific question and the specific structure that the prompt to the particular program that you're applying to is asking for. Um, which obviously means that you cannot, going on to the next point, that you cannot copy and paste, um, like I said, even within one university, if you're applying to two programs or if you're applying to two programs in different universities that are very similar, even then, while your points, your uh, the things that you're talking about, your background, your academic journey, etc., while the points will be very similar, but you cannot use the same statement, you have to structure it differently, you have to tailor it to the particular program. Uh, that you're applying to or the particular scholarship that you're applying to. Um, and then, um, like uh, some of the previous speakers have mentioned, you also have to be very specific in terms of why you're applying to that particular program or scholarship, which is why your statement can be the same. So you need to do a lot of research about the particular program or scholarship. You have to look at their values, their research interests, uh, what kind of people are they looking for, and then then you have to tailor your statement um, to fit that criteria and show them how you fit uh, the criteria and also show them why you picked their department. So for instance, you can mention that like some people have said, you can mention names of specific journals um, that the department may have or specific research centers that the departments are part of um, or, or just a broader research interest that people in the department are working on. Or you can mention names of specific professors of the department just to show that you have done your research and to show, um, like Arabia said, that you're not just applying or on a whim. You have really thought this through. Um, be simple and concise. So um, as we talked about during the section on the structure, you have to structure it really well. It should have a very clear structure. Uh, you know, however your own writing process works, just go through that, but make sure that the final product is very well structured. Um, it's usually better to do it chronologically, but however it is done, it should have a clear structure. When the person who is reading it, um, they don't know about you, they don't know about your background, so make sure that it's not haphazard. Um, it's very clear to someone who's reading about you for the first time, who has no knowledge about anything that you've been doing. Um, so make sure, think of it from that perspective and make sure that it's very clear to them what you're trying to convey. Um, throughout your writing, keep your storyline in mind, whatever storyline you've thought of, just keep that in mind um, and keep the structure flowing according to that. No matter how many examples you choose to use, no matter what you choose to talk about, so whether it's your degree, whether it's your work experience, whether it's your volunteering experience, whatever it is, no matter what you choose to talk about, throughout all of that, just make sure that you have that storyline in mind. And you're not only, you, you're showing the reader how everything that you're talking about is connected to that storyline, how all of those bits and pieces fit in to that one narrative. Just stick to that narrative um, to keep it structured. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so be personal. I think we've already covered that. So not only in terms of, um, not only in terms of the department that you're applying to, using their information, but also uh, when you're writing about yourself, about your background, use specific examples, um, generic statements like "I'm very passionate about this." They don't really uh, hold any sort of value. You have to give very tangible, very specific examples. For instance, um, and this applies across like um, all the applications. So like some of them, uh, some scholarship program, for instance, focus on leadership. So the whole point of it is to give very tangible examples of one particular, it could be one particular incident, it could be one particular organization, which you have to be very specific and talk about how exactly you've, um, you know, what work you did or how you show leadership potential, whatever it is, but just give very specific examples. Um, don't be generic anyway. Um, 
Then I think the next point is very similar to what Rabia just discussed. Um, I'd say give yourself time to do this, to go through this whole process. It's a long process. Don't think that it's just like, oh, it's just a thousand words or it's 500 words. I can do this in a day or a week. Um, give yourself as much time as possible. Uh, if you have more time, then you can go through all those steps that we talked about. So first, you just go through the brainstorming process. You just figure out what you want to tell them. You want to figure out what... Uh, examples you want to highlight, what story you want to tell, and then you can start going through the writing process itself. And then once you're done with like your first draft, um, show it to other people. Um, go, you'll have your mentors, of course, but also like if you want to branch out, reach out to other people. Feel free to do that. You can use um, connections from like LinkedIn. You can uh, look at the university alumni, the program alumni. And they, they'll usually give you a very helpful perspective because they've been through that process. They know what the department is seeking or what the scholarship program is seeking. Um, so just try to reach out, have other people read it. If you have helpful instructors, if you have helpful um, colleagues or managers, just um, usually taking in their input is quite helpful. Um, and it also helps you structure your uh, research uh, proposal or your statement better. Um, Lastly, again, just reiterating, write properly. Um, you have to use academic, you have to use an academic style. Um, it is supposed to be more informal and more personal than your uh, research statement, but that doesn't mean that you can um, just use a very informal sort of language. It has to be very well structured. Structured. You have to ensure that you use proper grammar, proper spelling, even things as small as, for instance, um, if you're applying to schools in the UK, you should make sure that you've used the UK version of spellings um, everywhere. So these kind of small things, which again, goes back to the previous point that give yourself time to do all of this. Um, that's the only way that you can look out for these little things, um, you know, run grammar checks, whether you use apps like Grammarly, uh, all these apps usually have like a trial free version, that sort of thing, which you can use. Um, there are a lot of AI tools as well, which you can use just for the grammar check, for the spelling check, for like ensuring that your sentences are structured well, those kind of things. Um, you don't have to use which you don't have to make it very, um, yeah, to, to don't use elaborate language. You can keep it simple. You can keep it concise. In fact, you should keep it concise, but just make sure that there are no spelling or grammatical errors and that, that it's written very clearly. Um, so I think that's that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, I think we can move on to the questions, Gayatri. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. That was really comprehensive. So I suspect people will have too many questions. But um, I do see. Can I, can I just add something here? Um, one thing okay. I wanted to say is do not plagiarize. OK, though, it might feel that, you know, you've changed a few words, you've, but there are softwares, even something as simple as Turnitin, when you submit something, um, it can clearly tell, even if you've paraphrased, how much percentage of something you've paraphrased and that, you know, just don't plagiarize. I know people do it. They think they won't get caught because they've changed words majorly. They're like, oh, I've changed the name of the university, but you can get caught. So yeah, I just thought I need to put that out there. Just to add on to that, please, please, please don't make chat GPT write your personal statements because its writing style is very, very, very distinct. And you can tell if you've made chat GPT write it, like, it sounds like chat GPT. It reads like chat GPT. Um, I mean, it's a very helpful resource for grammar checking and whatnot, but um, not not to make it write your personal statements. It's really not worth it. Thank you both. That's very useful advice to have. Um, I do see one question in the Q&A box. Um, whoever wants to pick up on it, please feel free to. Um, basically, the mentee is asking, is there a difference between a personal statement and a statement of purpose or an academic statement? Anyone who has had to, uh, I, I know that quite a few of you have applied for scholarships as well among the panelists. Um, did the statement that you had to submit for your um, scholarships, was that any different from the statement that you submitted for your university applications? Uh, oh, okay, go ahead, please. No, no, please go ahead, Kansa. 
So I've had to write both a statement of purpose and an academic statement. And um, sometimes they are similar if, if the program only asks you for one, but some scholarships ask you for both. Um, and the way I usually explain it is that uh, for personal statements, you have to tell them about your story, what drives you as a person, your trajectory, what you, the change that you hope to create, uh, the impact that you hope to have. Um, but then it's very connected to your academic statement, wherein you describe more of your academic journey and your academic curiosities and the questions that guide you. Um, and and the, the things that you've done, like papers you may have written, those kind of things. Um, and obviously they are similar, Particularly if the program only asks you for one, then you have to incorporate elements of both. But if it's two different things, then you just uh, make them different with reference to um, the things that guide you as a person, your values, your dreams. And then within academic um, journey, then you talk about that in academic statement. I don't know how clear that was, but that's how I've done it. No, you're right, Maria. I think um, it does depend pro very program to program. So say the DPhil I'm in, they, they ask for an academic CV. So you have a personal statement and then you have an academic CV because there's not so much you can add to a personal statement. And you need to, you know, kind of show different facets of yourself in one document. Um, say by the time you're doing your PhD, they expect you've done considerable research. So you will have, you know, multiple publications, multiple grant names, multiple consortiums you're a part of. And hence, then they require an academic statement. So in an academic statement, yeah, you can mention your courses, but you won't mention like your extracurricular activities or say your disabilities or how that impacted your education. So it varies from program to program. And it's more common for a PhD. They either ask for an academic CV, so that's more point based. But if they want you to elaborate more, then they ask for um, an academic statement. Excellent. Thank you all. Uh, Mohsin seems to have a question. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself, Mohsin. Am I audible? Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much for uh, such an insightful session. And uh, I have written my SOP of about two pages. And in the first paragraph, I introduced myself and then outlined my research interest uh, very clearly. And in the second paragraph, I highlighted some of my academic achievements, uh, which are from 10th and 12th grades, which are relevant because I received scholarships based on my grades uh, being above 90%, something like that. So to clarify, I just used only five sentences or six to seven lines for this paragraph. Would it be appropriate to mention them or should I just start with explaining my undergraduate journey? So Mohsen, if it's something like, say, you've achieved 90 or 95 or you were the top 10 of the cohort, yes, mention it because, you know, that sets you apart. Uh, okay. But I would say don't don't dedicate five or six sentences to it because that's almost one paragraph. So you could just maybe dedicate two or three sentences highlighting that you've been a high achiever in this particular yeah. subject since grade 10 or 11, whatever grade that is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question I have. So I am yes. working on two uh, research projects in parallel and I am in the final stages of getting those papers published. Uh, considering the time of application uh, and the time it will take for my application to be reviewed, uh, my papers will have then have been submitted, right? So the point is, I'm not sure in which journal my paper will be submitted. There are two options for me here. Uh, uh, I can state clearly in my in the paragraph where I am explaining my research uh, projects, I can state clearly that I am in the last stages of publishing the paper. Or uh, there is another, another option. I can state that this paper will soon be submitted to a higher tier general like IEEE access. So what so, would you suggest? No, Mohsen. So the thing is, unless and until it's in press, and mm -hmm. in press means that the journal has agreed and approved it. So say if I did a study, like say for my MPH study, I did a study that looked at vaccination of taking a certain population. So when it wasn't published until then, I would just say I undertook this study and this is what the study found and how that was significant. But once it was published, now I add and the study has been published in this journal with impact factor this. So unless it's in press, it's not worth mentioning because Technically, every student will say, I've done a high impact study and it will be published 
or I'm submitting it to this journal. But, you know, the turnover count for every journal is so high. Uh, so it won't really add much value to it. So as a researcher, I, I this is just like, you know, it's only worth mentioning if it's in press or published. Okay. Or I, or I can just explain what I have learned from this research project or what I have actually contributed, right? Exactly. Your, contrib your findings, like how is that finding any, what value did you add? What was it that you have found that previously nobody knew? Is it in conflict to what they previously known? Have you reiterated something they previously knew? That is more important. So if you haven't published something, it won't be used against you, but just maybe focus on then what you have, which is your findings. That will bring value as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, also, as Mohsin mentioned, that he has been reviewing statements of purpose for the last two years. Uh, is there any way I can get my uh, SOP got reviewed by any of you? Any one of you? Uh, Mohsin, I would advise you against just asking the fans on this call. Instead, drop an email to the OPP and Project Edu Access teams. In fact, all of you will be receiving. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you've been shortlisted for one on one mentorship or cohort mentorship. But depending on what you have been shortlisted for, you will, will shortly be told exactly how you can get your application documents reviewed. Um, but very briefly, if you've been shortlisted for one-on-one -on -one mentorship, you're expected to get your documents reviewed by your mentors. Uh, but if it's cohort mentorship, then you will receive a separate form where you can upload your documents for review and they'll be reviewed. Um, so Thank let's you. let's hold off on that for now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick questions from the chat. Um, so there are a few um, who are saying, uh, well, the area of study is chemistry, but they do have a few articles in um, other fields of study. They're asking if it's okay to mention these in the SOP too, or would you recommend that they only mention them in the CV? Any advice? Um, I can I can take that one. So I guess it's, it's kind of reiteration of what we've said. If you think that article in any way is bringing value to the program you're applying to and your future goals, then mention it. But if it's not, then I would say put it in the CV because you don't really have a lot of word counts for your SOP. I know it sounds a lot like oh, one and a half page, but once you start writing, it's not a lot at all. So only things that bring value to your standing as an applicant or candidate for the program only add that. I mean, you probably have done studies, you've probably published papers or attended conferences, which now are not relevant to this field. So I would say put those in the CV. Perfect. And and just a related question. There's someone here who has written an article um, in their university, but they haven't published it anywhere. Uh, would you advise that they mention it in their SOP or not? Oh, should I answer that? Okay, <laughs> I feel like I'm doing most of the talking. I'm so sorry, <laughs> you know. Okay, so I think it, it comes down to that thing again, as in how is it bringing value? So if you've written a paper, that means you've undertaken a research study. That's how I take it as. So if you're telling me you've written an essay or you've written a journal article or you've reviewed, you've written a review of different articles or studies. So I'm assuming you've done a research study. So rather than, if it's not published, of course, then, we can't give it credibility. So then rather than focusing on the publication, which is not published, focus on what you found from it. That brings more value. I hope I've answered the question sufficiently, but That's happy fine. to take any follow-up questions. Perfect. Uh, Kasim, you have your hand raised. Feel free to ask your question. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for taking my question. So uh, I'm a little bit uh, confused about uh, the statement of purpose and uh, academic writing essays, uh, because if uh, I talk about, so uh, my question is, what is the difference between a uh, statement of purpose or a personal statement and academic writing essay? Uh, so if I talk about uh, the, applica the online application of uh, University of Cambridge, so uh, I have already uh, completed this process so uh, in in reason to apply uh, uh, you have only uh, limitations of uh, i think 1500 characters and in academic essay uh, uh, you you will have uh, 2000 words of academic uh, academic writing essay so i am little bit so confused about so i can answer about... this i can answer mm -hmm. this question um 
if it's asking uh, you for I, an I, academic I, I, Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt you sorry to interrupt you i want to add something uh, about this uh, because uh, 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 in reason to apply uh, you have a limitation of 1500 character so uh, how it possible to uh, to write all these uh, uh, these uh, things that uh, uh, i think uh, rabia has uh, already discussed and uh, she has given a comprehensive overview uh, about this so please uh, kindly uh, highlight this question i know that cambridge has a very very short word limit but you really need to use each and every word within that limit wisely and really summarize um to try to answer those questions usually if it's that short i always tell people whose uh, documents i review to write a sentence on each of the themes and sort of make it blend it together and uh, make it into a mini essay uh but just to clarify we've mentioned three separate things right um statement of pur- purpose academic statement which is what i discussed earlier in terms of them being different because statement of uh, purpose requires you to describe your story your interest who you are what your passions are where you're coming from academic statement is when you're talking about uh, you know your academic interests and um the things that you've done for those and then you have these essays so these essays or research papers are things that you've written for classes or that you may have written in the discipline or say um a report that you may have written or any of those things and then they give you this word limit sometimes it's 2000 words sometimes it's 3000 words so sometimes you have essays which are 2000 words that you may have written for a course and you've gotten really good grades mm. and they are related to the discipline you're applying for you can submit those you can talk to your professors and you can tell them that that's you know it's a writing assignment you're preparing for your application um sometimes you have a thesis or a longer report and then you can use an extract from it and clarify that it's an ext- extract uh but you need to make it clear um that you know what it is and the reason that you wrote it and um you also need to make its connection to you know make make some sort of a connection to the degree that you're applying for for instance if you're applying for chemistry it it can't be your writing sample can't be related to english because that's not what they're looking for unless it's just to test mm-hmm. your linguistic proficiencies um yeah sometimes mostly people have already written essays on different things and they choose to use those but sometimes if you don't have an essay written then you need to write a new one and you work with your professor thank you so much thank you both uh amna please feel free to ask your question amna we can't hear you yet i'm not sure if you're saying something audible now yes okay i'm just asking the question uh, uh, first of all i would like to thank all the mentors for such a nice guidance about the process in which we can write our personal statement so uh, i would like to ask the question as we are entering into some specific subject so subject is a very generic term if we are working on the specific domain first uh, like i would like to consider the organic synthesis uh, in the field of chemistry so i'm if i'm working on a specific project or i have worked on a specific project in my undergrad studies can i change my field of study uh, restricting to the same organic synthesis in the same organic synthesis domain can i change my uh, research interest to the other thing that inspires me the most uh, i'm passionate about something uh, more can i change my uh, research um i can answer that yes i'm i mean that there, there is no limit on what you can do you know you are the one who decides what you want to study and just like i said you know in england it is incredibly common that you know just like i said one day a policeman wakes up and decides he wants to be a nurse and then the next day he decides he wants to be a lawyer so you see people transitioning in their career this this is very very normal um but you need to maybe then reflect that okay i am making a change this is what i've done in the past 
Now, I don't know whether the two fields, because I, I couldn't hear you well, uh, if you are, say, transitioning to another field, if they are somewhat related or not related at all. So you need to kind of make that connection. I heard something you said you did organic chemistry, if I'm not wrong. Uh, yes. And what is it that you want to do? Uh, basically, in organic, uh, in the field of chemistry, uh, I basically work in the organic synthesis on the uh, synthesis of ionic liquid modified hydrogels. Now I'm asking the question, can I change my uh, research from the synthesis of hydrogel to something else, uh, but remaining in the same dimension of the organic synthesis? No, I mean, you can. I mean, you can. It really depends, right? So, which labs are actually actively looking for students? So, maybe what you've studied currently, no lab is, you know, looking for any masters or DPhil student in that field, and maybe some else other labs. So, the idea is not that you're going to replicate or just carry on, say, you know, on the dot what you did as an undergrad. You probably have learned such good transferable skills in this lab or in this research that you can apply to other varied researches as well. Um, so it's not like, say, if you have worked with a certain molecule, you will continue working with that molecule, or you will continue working, finding that same aim or objectives. You re you know, if you have transferable skills that you think will bring value to another team, even if it's not chemistry, say it's biomedical sciences, or it could be anything, you can definitely apply. As long as you can show and demonstrate that you bring value with you from your previous experiences. Okay, thank you so much, Rafa. Thank you both. Um, I see that uh, Mohsin has a question again. Go for yes. it. So would it be fine if I ask a question not related to the SOP? Uh, okay, how about we get through the SOP questions and then if we still have time, we get to yours. Is is that okay? okay because I see some in the chat. Thanks. Fine, fine. Just, I mean, I only see one question, so I'm sure we'll get to you in a second. Um, there's someone who's saying, can we mention our work experience that motivated us to get into a certain field? Yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, I think that is the greatest motivation ever. So I'll give you my example. When I did my undergrad, I did biomedical sciences. And just like every Pakistani family, I was told I was going to become a doctor. But then I started working and doing research. And I realized, no, I actually like answering questions. I actually like looking at data and painting pictures. And I don't really like interacting with people much. So, you know, you, you, you see that I then worked in research and then I used that as a backing for me to get into an MPH. And I used, after my MPH, I worked at Public Health England. I worked at AstraZeneca and I actually used those experiences to get into a DPhil. So your work is a motivation because most, you know, that's where you actually answer the bigger questions, right? That's where you actually apply your knowledge to the real world. So I think the motivation you get from a workplace is absolutely remarkable because that's when you're like, okay, I've worked in the field and these are the gaps I actually identified in the field. So definitely, if, if you work in the field, that brings a lot of value to your application. Yeah, I agree. And I just wanted to add that the workplace and anything that is also sort of, as we'd say, non-academic can also be an area for learning. And that's also valuable. So whether it's been, uh, you know, internships, work experience, volunteer experience, all of that can still be very valuable in informing your motivation and as part of your learning. Yeah, I actually agree with Shanze because, and volunteering is very important. So if there's any way you can get volunteer experience, that will bring value. Because I do know one of the struggles for um, students from Pakistan is that sometimes, you know, it, it's, it's like a sequential thing. You did your bachelor's and the next sequential thing is you're going to do your master's. So you don't have that time to work. Or after master's, people just decide, well, you know, I've graduated and the next thing is I'm going to go for a DPhil. So you can, if possible, try to maybe incorporate some volunteering in there. And that can, you know, you can translate that into so many good transferable skills. So not necessarily if you haven't had the opportunity to work with an NGO or a bank or some consultancy, that shouldn't stop you. Just like Shanze mentioned, volunteering is a great, great thing. Thank you all. Um, 
The next question, I think, will be a good segue for us to also take Mohsin's question, uh, which is, how does one not fall into the trap of just reiterating everything that's in the CV, once again, in the um, SOP? Um, there, there's someone here who's saying, I've attended and organized several conferences and seminars. I've published two articles, but I've said all of this in the CV already. So how, how do you package all of this in a different way um, in the SOP if you should even be mentioning all of this? I'll just say a few words and if anyone wants to add. So the CV is your, it's kind of your guide of your what. This is all you've done, the what of what you've done. And as we've been talking about, the personal statement needs to be more than a what. It needs to be your why and your how. So whilst you can and you should reference things that you've put in your CV, as we've been saying, really you're trying to pick out and highlight the most relevant of those conferences, of those articles, of your work that inform your why. So really elaborate on what did you learn from it? What are your perspectives on it? Uh, how is it relevant to the field of study and where you want to go? So your CV won't go into any of that. It'll just say very simply like what you might have achieved and in what role, what you might have published, where. But your personal statement is your chance to really dig deeper uh, and really elaborate to the admissions committee how that's shaped your story and uh, and your journey. So it really shouldn't be the exact same thing that you've mentioned. It should reference it, but go deeper. You want to add to that? That was a great answer, Shanzeez, I'm sure. Um, there isn't anything else to be said there, but uh, Mohsin, you have the floor now. Thank you. So currently I am approaching professors at universities and uh, spending a lot of time uh, crafting an effective email, uh, you know, uh, relating my previous work, research work, uh, according to the uh, current works they are doing, they are conducting uh, in their institution. But what if I, uh, I am, because I am not getting any replies from any of them, right? So should I still consider applying to dead universities? Considering the fact that I I strongly feel that my SOP and my LORs are uh, are strong enough to get ad admit, I think my uh, profile. Uh, uh, if we talk about the SOP and LOR, I have strong LORs and strong SOP. I can take that if nobody else is answering. So, Mosin, yeah, you definitely can. Um, it won't be used against you that you know no professor has responded. So say. Because there are different kinds of PhD or master's application, right? Some are advertised where they say this team is doing this project with these two or three professors, and they'll always share the name of three or four uh, primary supervisors. And sometimes they're not advertising any um, project, and you apply, and should you have the grades, and they like your CV and your personal statement, they can then pair you with the professor. So if the professors aren't responding, which is very common, very, very common, because they're incredibly busy. Um, don't let that stop you. So go ahead, apply. If you think your letters of recommendation are strong, your SOP is strong, go ahead and apply. The department will assess you, and then they can always pair you with the supervisor later. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. And a quick question on writing samples as well. There is a mentee here who's saying they have published an article of 900 words somewhere. Can they use that same published article um, as a writing sample in their university application? So I think it really comes down to what kind of writing sample they're looking for. So in my case, for clinical epidemiology and medical statistics, they asked for our writing, scientific writing. And of course, I uploaded four of the papers I had published. So I think a good thing, and another thing is do not hesitate to reach out to the admissions committee. The guidance they can give is invaluable. So if, if you feel like there's not sufficient information on what kind of work they're seeking, just reach out to them and say, you know, this is what I have. Do you think this this is sufficient. Do you think this this is what you're seeking? Um, so I think it depends from department to department and program to program. In my program, that's basically what they wanted. They wanted us to upload something that we had published. 
um, a PDF of what we had published. So I think it might vary. Now, I'm not sure what Shanze or uh, Vajia or the other panels think from their fields, because I think it might really greatly vary from field to field. Any thoughts on that, Shanze or Vajiha Kansa? Honestly, it just matters if it's relevant um, and if it's well written. Like, uh, you don't need to worry if it's very, very relevant. You can just state that it's an article you've written that has been published. Make that clear in the explanation, and you should be fine. Perfect. Uh, and we have one more question on writing samples. Can we put references um, in the academic writing sample? Oh, you must. You must put references. Um, sometimes they're counted within the word count. Sometimes they're not. Very, very rarely it'll be written that they don't need references. But if it's an essay or if it's an academic piece of writing you're submitting, then by default, you need to include the references and citations. I've never seen a program that doesn't require you to submit them. Perfect. Um, there were a few other questions in the chat, which uh, Vajiha has very, very kindly responded to. So those of you who put some questions in the chat, please, please um, check the responses that you've received within the chat. Um, if there are any final questions, please feel free to raise your hand or put them in the Zoom chat. Uh, if not, then let me once again reiterate our huge thanks to our five panelists. I, I should have said earlier that Mohsin had to um, leave the meeting a little early, but um, once again, thank you to all five of you for uh, you know, sharing your own experience with, sorry, Hussain, did you have a question? No, okay. Um, yeah, but thank you all for sharing your, uh, your own experiences with putting together the statements of purpose or even reviewing statements of purpose that um, applicants usually submit um, and for taking all these questions very, very patiently. Um, just to reiterate, uh, as always, you will receive recordings um, of both the workshop that happened yesterday as well as the one that happened just now uh, by email. Uh, so please, please do keep an eye out um, for the email and then you can always come back to some of the things that was um, that were discussed during this workshop. Um, and we'll be in touch again uh, during the week with details about uh, the workshops that are being planned for the next weekend and the weekend thereafter. As you know, this is a work workshop series with 10 workshops and we are done with six of them. So two more weekends and we'll get through this workshop series and potentially transition to a different set of programs um, for all of you. Um, but yeah, I think that's where we close. Thank you so much to all the panelists again and thank you to everyone who joined. See you next weekend. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. Thank you. Good luck to everyone. <laughs>